Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Inspiring you to bring God back into the conversation of the day. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're gonna fly, we fly like eagles, arms out wide. If we're gonna fear, we fear no evil. We will rise by your power. We will go by your spirit. We are bold. If we're gonna stand, we stand as giants. If we're gonna walk, we walk as lions. Good news! I have good news for you this morning. God continues to. Uh, fan the flame of the gospel, and he continues to expand the ministry of Faith Radio. So thank you to each and every one of you who support Faith Radio. Um, when we ask you um, to financially support this ministry, you you so graciously give, and that means that we're able to say yes when God says, hey, come over here. I got something for you to do. So we're so grateful God continues to expand the reach of Faith Radio to more and more people so that they might hear the good news of the gospel. Good morning to those of you in Billings, Montana, um, praying for our newest Faith Radio family members in Montana. And I would ask you to pray with us that, you know, the flame of revival continues to be, you know, fanned as, um, as God continues to get himself glory and amplify the good news of the gospel through um, through this media ministry. You can check out who we are and what we're doing at MyFaithRadio.com. Welcome to those of you listening for the very first time today. My name's Carmen LaBerge. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen, um, 6 to 8 a.m. Central. So, you know, 5 to 7 for those of you out in Mountain Time Zone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, and um, hey, for those of you listening in places where Faith Radio has been on the air for Ah, 75 years now, um, specifically the Twin Cities, I, I got something for you this morning. Yeah, yeah. Ding, ding, ding. If you're listening in the Twin Cities um, or Duluth, I got something for you this morning. So a few months back, you will remember that, you know, I tried to like invite myself over. <clears throat> and so the way that we did that was we invited you to invite me to your community for a faith radio event. So we are diligently working on putting those together and we have now scheduled two of them and they're coming up pretty quick. So thank you to every person who nominated your community to host a faith radio event. If you are in the Twin Cities and you are available to meet with me on Saturday, April the 20th, we're gonna gather at 10 a.m. If that's something that you wanna be a part of, you need to text the word meet, M-E-E-T, text the word meet to 877-933-2484. And if you are in Duluth and you are available to meet with me on Sunday, April the 21st, um, text the word Duluth to 877-933-2484. Yes, the Duluth event will be in the afternoon, so everybody can go to church on Sunday morning. We'll get together on Sunday afternoon in Duluth, text the word Duluth to 877-933-2484. All right, so in the Twin Cities, you're available on Saturday the 20th, mid-morning, text the word MEET, M-E-E-T, to 877-933-2484, or in Duluth for Sunday the 21st. Text the word Duluth. Um, all right, and and so, yeah, we're working on it, and I look forward to connecting with you. And, yes, stay tuned because there are additional events in the works, you know, because I, you know, I like to invite myself over, you know, because you guys have the good snacks. <clears throat> All right. So uh, we've been talking about all the ways that we apply the mind of Christ to everything going on um, in in life. And so this caught my attention um, I think it caught my attention because it was just a couple of days ago when we were talking about the eclipse and um, and we were talking about that giant accelerator thing, you know, through which they discovered the quote unquote God particle. So this caught my attention. Nobel Prize winning physicist Peter Higgs um, has died at the age of 94. Um, he was an emeritus professor in Edinburgh and he was known for discovering the Higgs boson, which is the subatomic particle 
that people called the God particle, which is super duper curious because um, this person, Peter Higgs, was an atheist, like a serious, verbal, outspoken atheist. And he didn't like that they called it the God particle. He wanted to call it the God something else particle. <clears throat> um, and so it's just an interesting conversation, right? This this is a big bang conversation. And in 2012, physicists used this large hadron collider in Switzerland to smash two beams of particles together at almost light speed, trying to recreate conditions that they believe existed at the quote unquote big bang. And so how do you think about all of that from a Christian perspective and a Christian worldview? Um, I I appreciate the ways in which um, God speaks through uh, the hearts and minds of really, really intelligent people. And so there is a particle physicist down at Letourneau University in Texas. His name is Stephen Ball. And he he has reflected um, on this Higgs Higgs boson God particle, and he th- and he says, you know, first of all, the 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 term is highly inappropriate. It's just a particle, um, and it's just a particle that enables particles to generate mass. He says it's not responsible for creating the universe or the particles or the fields within the universe. Yes, it may help us solve one outstanding puzzle of the standard modicle of particles and fields, but it doesn't answer ultimate questions of origin. So regardless of the claims of scientists, he says, and he makes quite a list, the existence of the universe still poses questions that continue to beg for answers, and those lie beyond the universe itself. He says, as a Christian and as a physicist, I find compelling reasons to believe that the God of the Bible carefully planned and created the universe. And the first verse, the first verse of the Bible is just as compelling to me as ever. For in the beginning, it was God who created the heavens and the earth. And the discovery of the Higgs boson does not in any way change this. Do you bring that kind of faith to bear um, on the headline news of the day? And maybe the most important question that Nobel Prize winning physicist Peter Higgs could have ever asked in this life is now not only fully answered, but he now knows the God behind the God particle. I think my concern today is that Peter Higgs lived his life denying God. And now he knows the truth. You and I have this life. We have this life as an opportunity to not only glorify God, but to declare his reality and his goodness to others. And so let's be busy doing that today. Our friend Heather Zeiger is going to join us next. She is a science writer. She serves as a research analyst at the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity. We're going to talk with her about her experience of the eclipse on Monday. She was in the path of totality. We're also going to have her help us reflect on what the Vatican Um, has just issued in terms of this um, Declaration of Human Dignity. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. All right, what in the world is going on where you are and with with your family and in your life, what's happening um, at the nexus of medicine and biomedicine and technology and biotechnology and, well, just being human. That's um, that's what our friends at the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity um, are working on each and every day. And um, Heather Zeiger joins us from um, the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity from time to time. She also happens to live in Dallas, Texas, and so she was in the path of totality of... Um, of the eclipse. So good morning, Heather. Good morning, Carmen. Was it awesome? It really was. It was pretty cool. I was, uh, so I'm in Dallas and my husband teaches at a, a large private school right, right in the middle of Dallas. So we all sat on the football field and the cloud, it was cloudy for most of the day, but the clouds were kind of going in and out. So we did get to use our eclipse glasses, look at the sun, uh, the moon covering up the sun. And I got to tell you, it got 
darker than I thought it would. And I'm even in the city where you have the ambient city light and it was it was like nighttime, like some of the night uh, nighttime lights came on and everything. Yeah, and the stars come out, right? Like that's like I think the thing well, that you can see like what stars you can see. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, if you were <laughs> if you were in a place where people see stars, <clears throat> Yeah. then you would yeah. have seen the stars like it. Yeah. And the cicada and yeah, you would have heard the tree frogs and all of the little night creatures. And it's crazy. It's d yeah. bizarre and fantastical. Yeah, it was, it was fun. It was neat. Okay. What, what do you think, Um, you know, why are scientists particularly in interested? Like, are there things you can study during an eclipse or because of an eclipse that you can't study other times? Like what's going on? Yeah, so this is this has been a long time thing where um, scientists have used these opportunities of the uh, total solar eclipse to make some scientific discoveries about our own sun. Um, famously, Einstein's theory of relativity was proven by um, looking at the bending of starlight around a total solar eclipse, um, something that you can't look at because the sun is normally too bright. And <clears throat> so during this eclipse, NASA launched uh, three rockets because they wanted to look at the upper atmosphere during the eclipse. So they launched three rockets in Virginia. So in Virginia, where they launched it, it was only 81% covered because, you know, I think you need some light for a, a rocket launch. So they did before, during, and I after the eclipse. I don't know why, but okay. Yeah, <laughs> right. And then um, folks at my alma mater, UT Dallas, uh, took the opportunity to study the Earth's ionosphere. So this is the... Um, part of the upper part of the atmosphere between it's basically the boundary between the earth's atmosphere and um, outer space so there's a lot of important things in the ionosphere um, including how we communicate and where satellites reside and then smu which is also a uh, university that's in dallas area they wanted to look at temperature and wind changes during the eclipse and i will mm. say sitting there on the football field you could feel that it got noticeably cooler um for dallas anyway noticeably cooler during when during the eclipse so that will be an interesting study so my um i i watched the eclipse with um or experienced the eclipse maybe a better way to say it with uh my 10 year old granddaughter along with my eight-year-old granddaughter but my 10 year old granddaughter made note of the fact when it started to get cold she said this is the temperature from eight minutes ago like this is the heat of the sun from eight minutes ago so eight minutes from now it's going to be really cold i'm like oh my God. Who are you and how do you know these things? And then we did a very, very extremely unscientific pro science project at my house. <clears throat> I wanted to know if my chickens, you know, would lay two eggs on the day of the eclipse because the sun would rise twice. But it, that's not what happened. The rooster crows more than once, but the chickens don't lay an extra egg. So there you go. You can let your sciencey people know that the LaBerge farm participated in, you know, Science Monday. And um, <clears throat> chickens don't lay an extra egg because of an eclipse. All right. All right. I know. Good to know. I know. Other people were not researching this, but, you know, you do, the, you do the projects you can do where you are. Tell me about the double brood of cicadas this year because I am, um, I am a little concerned I'm, that I might be in the path of totality of the double cicada <laughs> emergence. Yeah, so this is this is one that um, I personally am glad I'm not in the uh, path of the double cicada. <laughs> I would rather be in the eclipse path. Uh, yeah, so there are different types of cicadas. Some cicadas, the ones that I'm used to seeing in Dallas, come out every summer, and um, cicadas live in the ground they feed off of tree roots and then once the soil gets a certain temperature they grow out of the ground and they come out of their exoskeleton in some sort of weird sci-fi looking way and they have wings and this is during their mating season and you can hear them so there are certain species of cicadas that only come out every 13 or every 17 years in other words they are living underground for 13 or 17 years and one species is 13. I think there's like two or three species that are 13 and then several that are 17. And then they, I don't know how they tell time. Nobody actually really knows how they know when 17 or 13 years is up. And they come out of the ground. Now, what's going to happen is it just so happens 
two of these species, one a 13, 13 year species, one a 17 year species, will be coming out of the ground at the same time, but not just the same time, but also the same place. Because sometimes this happens in various places in the Midwest and Northwest or Northeast and Midwest. Um, the place of convergence is largely going to be Illinois. So I'm sorry to my mm-hmm. friends that are in Illinois, uh, Springfield, Illinois in particular. So this only happens where they happen to both overlap in in location and in time about every 221 years. And for all of the kids out there in algebra, it's because 13 and seven, 13 times 17 is 221. So that's your greatest common multiple there. Um, so this is kind of the type of thing that entomologists get excited about. The rest of us get a little creeped out about. Okay. That's going to be an extra credit question on like so many yeah. tests and quizzes. So tell us again, 13 times 17 is 221, and that's why yes. there's this convergence of these cicadas, the brood that only emerges every 13 years and the brood that only emerges every 17 years, every 221 years, both of them emerge, which is right. crazy and gross. And the fact that that's just all living beneath the earth for so long wigs me out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and um, and how what's deep, neat, Carmen? Like how deep are they? Like, how what is going on beneath my feet? Hmm. Yeah. So, um, and this is one of those things that I think environmental scientists can tell you. Um, and I really think this is a cool thing about God's creation. So I'm I'm more of the chemistry side of things, but my environmental scientist friends will tell you that like all of these creatures, you have things going on below your feet. You have things going on, and it's all part of a process that's important for like. Um, for dealing with trees, they feed on roots. So this helps keep the trees alive. It has to do with the soil. There's all these cycles here and it all fits together. So I uh, I don't know for sure what these particular species uh, feed on because I think different cicadas feed on different things. That's why they're regional. Um, and it's kind of a little grody to think about that. And then again, you're really glad that they're there to help promote the growth of trees and life cycles and all of those things. Okay. Yes. I know there's some of you already uh, Googling, can you eat cicadas? Um, And um, yes, you, you can. So we could talk about that on another day. Um, We're going to take a very brief break. When we come back, we are going to circle back around to the conversation um, about the Vatican um, issuing this human dignity declaration. And the reason that we're going to talk with Heather about this is because the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity has a ton of stuff already posted um, that is going to help you um, not only understand issues related to life and human dignity, but some of the topics that are dealt with in this Vatican paper um, are dealt with, you know, in other ways, but also from a Christian perspective, affirming life. Um, at the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity. And so I just want to provide you with some resources as you are are considering the conversations that are happening in the culture today um, and and have you be fully equipped. So we're going to continue our chat with Heather here in just a moment. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. I'm Carmen LaBurge, host of Mornings with Carmen. I love a good story, don't you? I love a good love story, a good mystery, a good travel log. I love a good turnaround story or a story that begins once upon a time and ends with happily ever after. So what's your story, specifically your Jesus story? What difference does Jesus make in your life? Could you tell it as a love story or a rescue story? However you tell it, trust me, we want to hear it. We love a good story. Connecting faith to life, Faith Radio. Okay, because I'm here to make sure you know some stuff that you didn't know before you tuned in, when I told you that you could eat cicadas... It is true, but apparently if you have a shellfish allergy, you want to avoid the cicada because essentially it's like a land shrimp. There you go. That's what I have for you on that. We will deal with that on another Taste and See Tuesday, closer to the emergence of the cicadas, when those of you in Illinois will have an abundance of them and will be talking with us about how you're snacking on them. (sighs) Okay. Heather Zeiger is here, and we want to have a life-affirming conversation Um, I know that you and I maybe have not read the entirety of the Vatican paper, but it does courageously defend the dignity of every human person. And so I thought it would be good to just give you an opportunity to reflect with us on the dignity of 
of human life and um, and and reflect as you want to um, on the topics covered therein. Yeah. So uh, this paper and it it's a twenty page document that apparently it has it has been five years in the making. So I can't speak too much to Catholic Church polity, but it was apparently a document that they've been working on since twenty nineteen, and yeah, they they do a good job of outlining the fact that every human being, regardless of their condition of life has to be respected, honored, and loved as being in the image of God. That's where we draw our idea of human dignity is that human beings are in the image of God. And that's an important point, no matter who the person is, no matter their disability, no matter what, they they have um, infinite worth, infinite dignity. Um, so the document does this job of, a good job of outlining this. And then it goes into, um, and it says clearly that while people like uh, trans people are welcome in the church. The church does not welcome trans ideology. And that was, uh, that was very, that was very courageous of them to, to make that distinction to say, yes, we welcome you in our church. First of all, that's courageous on one side of it, where some people are like, no, we don't, we don't even want people like that in our church. But then it's also courageous of them to say, but we're not going to welcome trans ideology. Um, and they also said uh, gender affirming surgery, uh, so-called gender affirming surgery and um, gestational surro surrogacy. So that's when a woman carries a baby that is not uh, her own. It's um, uh, from the genetic material of another couple. Um, those are affronts to human dignity. So, uh, Carmen, you know, these are things that, that I've written about. I've written about gestational surrogacy before, and we've talked here about some of the issues with gender affirming surgery and how, you know, there's not a way to vet, for example, like what if uh, gender dysphoria it has to do with trauma or mental health? And that is a, a mental health issue, and yet they're trying to solve this with a, a using medicine. And, and sometimes um, uh, crippling people permanently in the sense of they, they end up regretting getting the surgery because it hasn't helped them with these problems. There's so many things we can talk about this. Um, but at the end of the day, the Catholic Church was outlining, look, people have dignity, but we're not going to affirm these things. Um, on that note, I will say, um, and this is a little bit of a cultural commentary um, here, but um, a lot of people were critical of the Catholic Church because uh, so is trans some trans folks spoke out and said this is contradictory to affirm a person's human di dignity because while not affirming gender ideology and I, I have problems with people conflating permissibility as affirming someone's dignity because you and I any of us we can believe that someone has infinite moral worth we can believe that they uh, you know, are made in the image of God and they have this inherent moral worth and yet still disagree with them even on very fundamental things. I mean, you and I as Christians would, we, we I mean, we go out, we talk to people, we have missions for this very reason of we, you know, see other people, non-believers, people that we do not, we would fundamentally disagree as having inherent moral worth. Similarly, people who we may disagree uh, with their lifestyle choices or their ideologies, we can still affirm that they have moral worth without being permissible. Okay, so you're juxtaposing their permissibility with what? With affirming a person's affirming. dignity. Okay. Yeah, I so can we can say affirm, so. yes. I can affirm a mm -hmm. person with without. Um, this gets to the the biblical um, understanding that you know you can do anything, but not everything is actually beneficial to you. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's the conversation that we have to we we have to know and we have to understand that there are things that are within God's um, will. And what he knows is best for us um, and things that are outside that, like there, there's mm -hmm. stuff in bounds, there's stuff out of bounds, and we don't get to draw the lines. Like those are lines that God has drawn. They are, um, he's the author of life and the giver of it. He's the one who defines marriage. He's the one that defines um, family. He's the one that defines, I mean, on, just go down, um, go down that list. And so I, I think that the part for me that I responded to um, and I like your language and appreciate that. Um, I think, you know, I'm sort of the one that's like, okay, 
it, it's the Catholic Church, and they're saying, here's what we believe. These are the standards that we understand, and we're getting um, – uh, we are – we exist to actually glorify God and let you know what God has said about some things. And we could have all kinds of discussions about whether or not the Catholic Church is in a, in a right position to do that. But they have said what they have said about the sources they are relying on. And so then for people to say the Catholic Church can't say that is, that's a, that's a you know, that's a, I just furrow my brow. I'm like, okay, who are you to tell the, to tell the Pope? Like, who who are you to tell the Pope what he can and cannot say about what God has said? So I just say it's a it's a curious time in terms of um people having a sense that whatever they want and whatever they think is actually um what everyone else must adopt. And that's what I think you're pointing to. And I appreciate that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I know. I didn't point yeah, to it as clearly as you did, but there you go. Yeah, I think that one of the quotes um in, in the document they they even refer to um, people must not tinker with or try to, quote, make oneself God when, and I think, Carmen, that we can all understand that because that is something sure. that it, that's what sin is, right? Instead of thy will be done, my will be done. I mean, that's, that's what, that's what we're all trying to outline here when we're talking about what is within God's will and what is what is outside of the bounds. And so, um, yeah, exactly where people disagree, but with them saying this, but this is this is within what they're trying to discern. Um, the Bible says and their documents say and the Christian traditional Christian views. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, there's people on the text line and they're super helpful. And somebody is here from the 218 area code saying, Carmen, you should know this as a chicken, you know, farmer. Um, <laughs> your chickens are laying eggs based on banked daylight. So, you know, how many hours of daylight they actually have. That's why in the winter, I know we supplement their light. So they still lay an egg every day. Um, and yes, I do know that. But you might have missed the fact that I have like little grandkids and they are really the ones that wanted to know since the sun's going to rise twice will the chickens lay two eggs yes it was an opportunity to talk about the fact that for every 12 or 14 hours of daylight we do get an egg from each chicken that's what i got for you heather as always thank you uh so much again welcome to our friends in billings montana you are listening to mornings with carmen this is faith radio um, if you're in Duluth and you want to join me on Sunday afternoon, April the 21st, text the word Duluth to 877-933-2484. If you're in the Twin Cities and you want to meet up with me on Saturday, mid-morning, April the 20th, text the word MEET, M-E-E-T, same number, 877-933-2484. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. How do you respond versus react? And what kind of reactor are you? I think we want to be like first responders and not nuclear reactors. And so here to talk with us about how we react or how we respond is Deb Folletta. She is a psychologist. She is an author. Um, you can find her and her network of counselors at DebraFoletta.com. Good morning, Deb. Good morning. It's good to be with you. Mm -hmm. So um, am I an emotional overreactor? Um, who, who is Anne and what was her question? Yeah, so the podcast is a hotline style show. So people call in all kinds of people with all kinds of questions. And a couple weeks ago, Anne called in wondering, you know, why do I overreact? She's in a relationship, a marriage where she just has a tendency to overreact um, in her relationship. When, when something happens, she responds with almost like a burst of negative emotion, mm -hmm. uh, maybe some aggression, you would say. And, you know, in, in counseling and psychology, I, I call these triggers they're these little sore spots that when somebody pushes up against them, they cause pain and we react. And I think we've all got them to some degree. So I want to talk about that. Um, it, you you use the term emotional trigger. Um, 
what what is that? You know, if you think about it like a bruise, right? Another way to word it is an emotional sore spot. And I think that's a helpful way because it kind of helps you conceptualize what's really happening. Um, you know, recently I I always I tell the story of when I was rushing out of the house with my four kids, which is like an Olympic event in and of itself, trying to get out of the house. You know, everybody's in a rush, grab all the things. And I wasn't paying attention. And I hit my shoulder on a coat rack on the way out. And it hurt. It caused a sore spot. Like I knew there's going to be a black and blue mark here later today. And sure enough, later in the evening, when my husband came to put his arm around me, he brushed up against the sore spot and I reacted. I had this reaction like, ah, you know, back up, that hurts. Now, here's the interesting thing about it. He didn't cause the sore spot, but he pushed up against it. And and so we have these emotional sore spots in our life from things that happened previously, from things that happened in the past, rejection wounds, abandonment, insecurities, you know, feeling like you're not good enough, all the things that happen in childhood, in previous relationships, from trauma. And we kind of live with these sore spots, these these pain points, Carmen, without even realizing that they're there until somebody pushes up against them, you know? And this is why relationships are so wonderful, but so difficult because relationships are essentially a mirror to our wounds, wounds that we probably wouldn't otherwise know are there. Because when you're living in isolation, there's nobody to push up against your sore spots. You know what I mean? That is, um, first of all, thank you for such a clear, understandable explanation. I do have like bruises from the past and they do get touched or pushed today. But the person who I'm with today didn't cause the bruise and they didn't intend to cause me pain now by touching a bruise they didn't even know was there. Like all of that is just so helpful. Yeah, I'm I'm so glad to hear it. And and let's be honest, like these are things I've had to learn along the way, um, even as a counselor, but in my personal life realizing, okay, why am I having such a strong reaction to this? I think we all have these like slow motion moments where we look at a situation and we're like, okay, yeah, that bothered me. That was annoying. That hurt my feelings. But why did I have such a huge reaction? So what you're looking for is an exaggerated emotional response. Like what are those situations where you walk away from and you're like, wow, That was kind of a lot. Why did I react so (laughs) overwhelmingly? You know, why was that such an exaggerated response? Um, And when we, when we calm down, when we settle down, we can like look in hindsight and say, okay, I overreacted. And so this was the pattern that Anne was having when she came in, like I'm overreacting and I know it. I'm so, so help, you know, and, and a big part of getting that help is first and foremost, identifying those source spots. Where do they come from? Where did they begin? What belief system, usually a faulty belief system, lives underneath the surface of that source spot? When did the enemy start to plant lies to to get you to a place of woundedness and pain? And how do we begin to allow God to heal those spaces? Mm. Um, it's like a, um, like a, a thorn that gets under your skin and then your skin grows over it because you never pulled it out. That, yeah. that would hurt. That would, that would still really, really hurt anytime it got, and it got touched and especially if it got pressed, um, at all, but you got to get it out of there. You got to dig it out. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about that. Once we identify the sore spot, Uh, Well, first of all, once we acknowledge that we're overreacting, we know it and we want that to change. And then we have taken the time to identify the sore spot, um, rooting out that faulty belief 
um, or rooting out the way the enemy planted a lie. That that's hard work. How, how do we do that? Yeah, it, it is hard work. And and you know what's interesting, Carmen, is so many times when these things come up, we automatically assume it's about our partner. Like they triggered me. It's about them. They hurt my feelings. Um, and we want them to take a hundred percent ownership. But really, if we overreact, there's probably a reason. We have some ownership here. And let's say our partner is becomes a perfect human being. Well, guess what? Somebody else is going to push up against that sore spot if we don't heal it. So healing is such an important part. It, it, and, you know, in marriage counseling, when people come to me or anyone from my team in counseling, our philosophy is that this isn't about a marriage. This is about two individuals. That's what it's about. Two individuals coming together and two individuals needing to do individual work of healing. Because as each one of them heal, that overflows into the relationship, right? So, mm -hmm. so how do we even begin to heal? And and and, and I think the fir the very first step is acknowledging the overreaction. Okay, I just overreacted. The second step would be to ask yourself, what was I thinking underneath the surface of this feeling of hurt, of overwhelm, of um, anger? What, what was I thinking? What's the belief underneath the surface? Maybe I was believing that my partner doesn't care about me. Maybe the belief is I am not good enough. And and, and, I, and I want you to try to put it in those words of like, what were you thinking and, and believing about yourself? I am unwanted. I am neglected by my partner. I am uncared for. What, what was that underlying belief? That can be hard to pinpoint, but it's a really important part of the healing journey. We're going to continue our conversation with Deborah Faleda. You can connect with her at DebraFaleda.com. We're talking right now about a particular episode of her podcast, and it's called Am I an Emotional Overreactor? I'm happy to send you the direct link for it. You can find it at TrueLoveDates.com. Uh, just text me, 877-933-2484. Um, maybe you are resonating with this conversation and you're like, yes, I am an emotional overreactor. I do have sore spots. I do overreact when people who are close to me um, accidentally um, press on those places. We're talking about, you know, what are the lies that are buried deep within and how do we how do we root them out? So we're going to continue our conversation um, with Deborah here in just a moment. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. If you're a new listener, we want to officially welcome you with a free welcome pack gift. Request yours today at MyFaithRadio.com. Maybe you are um, in a support group of um, of parents with kids, or maybe you've got a group of friends that gets together to... Um, uphold one another, not only in the faith, but in the challenges that we face in life. Kathy's on the text line right now, 877-933-2484. She says the emotional triggers are something we often address in my support group of parents with kids struggling with addiction issues. And we have a an often repeated phrase, quote, practice the pause to avoid overreaction. We're talking with um, counselor and therapist Deborah Faleta. You can find her at DebraFaleta.com. We're talking about a recent podcast at True Love Dates. Um, it's called Am I an Emotional Overreactor? We've been talking about those sore spots we all have. And then when somebody um, brushes up against those sore spots, that's when we overreact. So what's under there? What is the lie that's buried down in there that needs to be rooted out? Um, Deborah, practice the pause to avoid overreaction. That sounds like a good um, a good strategy. A very good strategy. In fact, I wrote a book called Reset. And honestly, if if you really want to learn a little bit more about this and and do a deep dive, Reset is a great resource. And the very first chapter, it's thirty one mini chapters to help you become emotionally healthy. And the very first one is to pause. 
So she is absolutely on the right track because you have to stop for a moment and understand what's going on inside of you. And if you don't do that, you're just going to respond to with your default mode, you, you know, whatever your default mode is, and unless you can pull back and, and pause and ask God to give you insight and clarity in that moment before you react. Um, and, and here's the thing. Some of you aren't that far along in your journey of healing where in the middle of a of a very difficult moment, it might be hard to, to pause. But for those of you who are still early on in the journey, make sure to pause at some point. Um, and usually it's after the situation passes and you calm down, you've got to be able to pause and make space for these questions, for curiosity. Okay, why did I do that? What was that all about? What was going on underneath the surface? It's those who nev never stop to pause and question. Those are the people who keep repeating the patterns over and over and over again because they're not making room for change in their life. But yeah, she's definitely on the right track. Pausing is such an important step. Talk with us about, um, is there a difference between pushing someone's buttons and what we're talking about today? Well, yeah, and, and here's what I think about it. When you have discovered a sore spot in someone's life, even sometimes before they've discovered it, you know what I mean? Like you see the reaction every time you say or do a certain thing. So so let's say that I'm working with a couple and, you know, every time the husband is late, the wife overreacts and, and just really struggles with it. Well, if he knows that, then I would say it is 20% his responsibility to not keep pushing that button as far as, as it is up to him. Mm. But nonetheless, her overreaction, her shutting down, her getting angry, her saying and doing things that she's embarrassed to admit, she's got to deal with that 80% herself. But once we've identified someone's source, but we might not know where it's coming from, you know, maybe her sore spot when he's late is actually rooted in childhood wounds of abandonment, you know, because her mom left the family at a young age and it was dad and the kids and they had to fend for themselves and it was a really painful season. And whenever he's late, it without her realizing brings up some feelings of I'm not important enough. I'm not a priority to him. I'm not important enough for him to care and be on time and, and be responsible like I need him to be. And it triggers some of those things from the past. He might not know that, but he sees the sore spot. Wow, she really overreacts to this, right? So when we observe somebody's sore spot, we've got to be careful with it. We've got to be tender with that sore spot. It is our job to be loving to the best of our ability, but it is our partner's job, our friend's job, our neighbor's job, our mom's job, whoever it is that we're in relationship with that's getting triggered. It is their job to do the healing work. Mm. This is so good. Um, all right, one more here. Um, uh, I think this is a person who's uh, fairly mature. They're saying, I've learned the pause. I can pause in the midst of the pain. My overreaction is delayed and it is self-sabotaging. Mm. I believe I that. Yeah. Right. That you can know, happen, some... right? Like sometimes our overreacting, <laughs> it doesn't happen in the heat of the moment. Like we right. stuff it, we stuff it down and then exactly. we go satiate it later. That's what I'm guessing they're talking about here. Exactly. Let's say, yeah. let's say you were at work and your boss said something that really hurt your feelings. You didn't say or do anything in the moment. Eight hours later, you go home and you binge watch Netflix and you eat the entire tub of Briar's ice cream and you just mm -hmm. shut down emotionally. But now it's hurting you and your life. That's an emotional overreaction. But like they're saying, it's a delayed response and it's self sabotaging. Why do I care so much about what? that person said, right? That's the underlying question. That's what we have to be curious and begin to invite God to do the healing work. Here's why when God reveals something 
it's because he intends to heal it. And when these sore spots start to make themselves known in our life and we open our eyes to them, we shouldn't just feel ashamed. Oh my goodness, I'm so messed up. Why do I have all these overreactions? No, our response should be, oh my goodness, God in his love for me is revealing the sore spots in my life that he wants me to focus on, that he wants me to heal, that he wants to extract from my life. He want, He's the surgeon that wants to do the surgery so that I can be healed of some of these mm-hmm. wounds from the past. And, and sometimes it takes going backwards to some of those hard places, which is where counseling can be such an important resource. Yeah, that's so good. All right. We have a massage therapist on uh, on the text line um, who's just talking about emotional pain points. She's a massage therapist whose husband does not like massages. Uh, he says, I cause the sore spots when I give a massage and I say to him, no, honey, I'm just discovering them. They were already there. <laughs> so it's a good, perfect analogy. Offer that perfect analogy. <laughs> hey, Deborah, as always, thank you so much. You guys should connect with Deborah Faleta. She is a psychologist. She's also an author and a podcaster. We've been talking about one of her podcasts today at truelovedates.com. This one's called Am I an Emotional Overreactor? We'll send you the direct links. Just text us 877-933-2484. Hey, thank you so much for your time today. And thank you for sharing your time with me. It's a total gift. It is absolutely 100% a gift to share this time with you, um, to talk with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, to prepare to walk as believers out there into an unbelieving world, to, to be encouraged with one another, to go be shiny. So let me encourage you, go, go shine like a light today. Be reflective of the one who is the light of the world. Let your light so shine before others that they will see your good works and glorify God who is in heaven. Let God get himself from glory, get himself his glory today through you, right? Yes, go out there and be a kingdom ambassador, uh, be a living demonstration of the, the character and the ways of God. Just let God get himself from some glory today through you. And oh, by the way, if you see something blooming, if you see something blooming, a flower or a tree, yeah, God sent those to you today. Those are flowers that God sent to you today. So enjoy them. Happy spring. Have a great day. God bless. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LaBurge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.